In this section, we're going to be looking at the different ways that the hardware and the operating system can isolate or segment processes, data, applications, and programs from other components inside the system. This is for security purposes. Let's keep this in mind. The whole perspective here is how to secure our processes and our data that is being worked on by the computer itself. So again, this is a combination of hardware and operating system. So first, we're going to look at uh, different levels of trust. And the more trusted a component is, the, the more resources that that component has access to. We'll look at memory segmentation. Now, we've already talked about physical segmentation, where I can isolate certain processes and data set to single CPU chips. And all other processes and data live on other CPU chips. That's physical segmentation. And then we also discussed the memory manager's uh, assignment of virtual addressing to the user level application so that the application doesn't really know where it lives in true physical memory. That is again logical segmentation. These are all different versions of process and data isolation. It's all the same as layering, hiding, abstraction. We are, we are securing instructions and data sets from other instructions and data sets that might be of lesser security or might even be malicious in nature trying to modify corrupt or steal that information then we'll look at virtual machines now a virtual machine is a un a non-physical computer that lives inside the operating system already running on a computer. Now we have a host machine and that host machine can support multiple virtual machines. We'll be describing several different types of virtual machines. Uh, these virtual machines are pretend computers, if you will, that live inside this one computer. Each of those machines uh, has its own security systems and mechanisms and can perform processing in this isolated virtual machine. If there's any security breach inside that virtual machine, we simply kill that virtual machine and we have not affected the host computer at all. This also isolates that virtual machine from all other virtual machines. So again, a virtual machine is another way of uh, segmentation, isolation, layering, and hiding. Another way to abstract processes and data from other processes and data. Then we're going to look at something called the protection rings. Now these are conceptual security boundaries that are implemented by the CPU manufacturers and then supported by the vendors that produce operating systems. We're going to look at a four ring protection ring model. This is what is used by the Microsoft operating system on the Intel CPU. We'll be discussing this in detail. Then we're going to look at I.O. protection, input output protection. We have to recognize that the channels that are used to input data and then receive data back out must be secured. They must be controlled. These are restricted interfaces and they are only going to provide access when the security kernel declares that it is safe for the, this access. Uh, this is again a major way that the bad guys will try to penetrate the system and or steal data from the system. Then we're going to look at the concept of the security domain. Uh, I'll give you the quick definition. A security domain is the collection of all objects that a subject can access. This is a subject's capability. Uh, this is the subject's level of privilege. This is a collection of all the things that a subject can do on a system, whether that's a read or a write or a delete, etc. That defines that subject's security domain. One other definition, one other term that is synonymous is called the user's security profile. Again, a collection of all objects that a subject can access. So it starts with the computer itself, that is the hardware, that is the CPU and the motherboard and the system around the CPU. And then, of course, that is useless unless we have an operating system that is designed and integrated with that particular CPU. Typically, the operating system identifies two different modes to execute code. 
we have user mode, which is also called problem mode. This is the less trusted mode of operation. And then we have privileged mode, also called supervisory or kernel mode. This is the most trusted entity on the system. And again, putting this in perspective, the less trusted a subject is, the smaller the security domain is. In other words, if I have less trust for you, I will let you touch fewer and fewer things. If I have more trust for you, I will let you touch a greater number of objects. And again, this is what we're describing is different levels of trust for different subjects that are performing work on a particular computer system. Processes of a higher trust can access more of the system's resources, and processes of a lower trust can access a smaller portion of the system's resources. And again, we've described the user mode the, in this diagram. The user mode is at the top half, the, the blue uh, section in the diagram. These are programs that the user has launched to perform the work that the user chooses to do. These are less trusted than kernel mode, that is the components that the operating system needs to implement. These are services and e executive components that the operating system requires to keep the system functional and secure. Down below at the lowest level we have the hardware uh, the hardware without an operating system is uh, useless. It's not effective. It's not functional. So the hardware and the operating system pretty much has to have to live together. Here we see the diagram showing the implementation of these protection rings. Again, this is an architecture, conceptual architecture, that is implemented in the Intel CPU and then supported by the Microsoft operating system. And I say, I'm using these as, as an example. All CPUs and all operating systems implement a ring structure. In this diagram, we see a four ring structure going from ring zero at the core to ring three at the periphery. Ring zero is the most trusted region of this ring structure. This is where the kernel lives. So the most trust says, the largest security domain, the greatest number of resources that that subject, the kernel, can access. Ring 3 is where the user lives. That's the applications that you and I launch on a computer system. We live in Ring 3, the least trusted region of the ring structure. And as a result, we have the smaller security domain, and we can only access a fewer number of resources. Now, we may gain additional access by making requests through the ring structure towards the inner layers and requesting access to some of these other resources. It is only by those executive services and the kernel of the operating system that we may or may not be granted access to those requested resources. To take this one step further, the executive services, such as the memory manager and the local security authority, live at ring one. Ring two is where the operating system's utilities and device drivers live. And uh, so some examples of components that live at ring two are the cryptographic service provider and something we're going to bump into in a little while called the security reference monitor live at ring two. So the kernel lives at ring one. The executive services live at, sorry, I said that incorrectly. The kernel lives at ring zero. The executive services of the operating system live at ring one. S operating system utilities and device drivers live at ring two. And then all user processes live at ring three. Ring zero is the most trusted with the greater security domain. Ring three is the least trusted with the smaller security domain. And again, as we've described, closer to the core, more trust, greater access. Further away from the core, out at ring three, less trust, and smaller access, uh, lesser access to resources. So this diagram shows those different security domains. Also, it identifies the need for information to flow from outer rings to inner rings. Now, this information flow, requests and, and information back out of this ring structure, is controlled through specific communications channels. These are restricted interfaces 
and they are referred to as application programming interfaces. Again, this is a functional tool, but it is also where we need to implement security. So they are security components as well. We only provide APIs to processes at higher layers that we choose and authorize access to. So here again we see the hardware at the lower layer, the kernel or the executive services in the mid layer, that's the operating system, and then we see the user level operating at the highest level. And again, we recognize that the user level programs need access to these internal resources that are controlled carefully by the operating system. So these requests must flow down through the specific executive services to request and then hopefully be granted access to the specific resources that the user program is, des is desiring. So again, the application programming interface is the controlled communications channel from one layer to another layer. Again, this is designed for functionality, but from a security perspective, it also must be highly secured. This is the way a bad guy will violate your security. So it's programmed communications channel between two layers, and in the ring architecture or the OSI model or any other layers that we're talking about, abstraction, layering, data hiding, black boxing, all of these, the portal, the communications mechanisms from that layer to any other layer is done through an application programming interface. Again, a key point for functionality, but more importantly, a key point for security. So this should be a carefully controlled interface. We see these interfaces between layers on network components in protocol stacks, drivers, etc. You see the list here. Again, any time we're talking about abstraction, layering, data hiding, black boxing, all of these require APIs so that the processes outside the, a particular layer can communicate with that layer so that it can get its work done and can then provide the output to the next layer as required. So we're going to take a closer look at the protection of different processes. And again, this is to ensure that one process cannot access resources in another area, another process's memory area. Uh, so they cannot modify the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of that other process's information. We've already described one area of process isolation, and that was with the stack. As you recall, the stack is a region of memory that is assigned to or allocated to a process on request of the program. It is protected by the security kernel of the operating system and if an unauthorized process attempts to access any of the information within the stack, the system declares an error and will terminate the offending process. On occasion, this will also require termination of the violated process. Another mechanism used to provide this isolation or protection has to do with encapsulation. And again, this is the layering, the, the data hiding, the abstraction boundaries, etc. And this affords a level of what we call black boxing. A process at layer one has no idea what's happening inside of layer two. All he knows is that through a particular API, based on a certain set of rules on how the communications will flow, the layer one process will hand information through the API to layer two. And what happens inside layer two? Layer one has no idea. So this is a way of encapsulation of these processes. Another isolation mechanism is time multiplexing of shared resources. This is where get different time slices are allocated to different processes. On a larger scale, substantially more coarse scale, we might declare that a particular computer system is available for processing of top secret data from 8 o'clock until noon. And from 1 o'clock in the afternoon until 5 p.m., we'll use that computer system for processing secret data. In other words, we would reboot into a different security mode 
for the afternoon period. So you see this is a very coarse form of time multiplexing. Most of the time when we refer to time multiplexing, we're talking about milliseconds of time, where we share a resource for a few milliseconds, uh, each, each process having just those few milliseconds of, of access. We have virtual mapping. We've described this already, where the memory manager identifies to a process or a program a, a fabricated or created memory addressing scheme. This then uh, is mapped to true physical addressing by the memory manager. So this is virtual mapping. And finally, we have the name distinction way of process isolation. This is where a process is giving a specific identifier, a process ID or PID, and that process now uh, may call other processes by their process ID and share information amongst them through these programmatic application programming interfaces, but may not access processes of another process ID. So here we see two different processes accessing resources in main memory and on the hard drive, and they are carefully managed and controlled through the security kernel of the operating system. And again, if process one tried to access a region of memory or hard drive space that process two was allocated, process one would typically be terminated by the security kernel of the operating system. And here's an example of the process ID. This is a screen capture from the task manager program in a Windows operating system. And you see the second column there shows the process ID. This is a naming distinction. And as processes are launched, they may have pre-assembled channels, communications channels, so that one process ID is allowed to, in an authorized fashion, communicate with another process of another process ID. Next, we'll look at virtual machines. Again, a virtual machine is a fabricated or phony computer that is assembled inside the operating system of the host computer. Many examples of uh, virtual machines include the NT's virtual DOS machine, the NTVDM. This allows DOS applications to be run on a Windows NT box, everything from Windows NT all the way up through the current Windows Server 2003. Another example is Microsoft's Virtual PC, VMware, and the Java Sandbox. These are all examples of virtual machines where to the processes inside that virtual machine, it is an entire computer dedicated to that process. However, it lives only in a host computer and is now providing a boundary or an isolation uh, boundary between the processes inside the virtual machine and the host computer, as well as between different virtual machines on the same system. So that if any one system has a problem, we can simply terminate that virtual machine and have no effect on the other virtual machines or on the host operating system. And here is a screen cap from the VMware application and a diagram that illustrates the example I just described. Next we'll look at input-output devices. Again, the major concept to keep in mind with I.O. devices is that this is a channel from the outside world into the processes that hold and manipulate the valuable information assets on the computer. Remember, these are all controlled through application programming interfaces, and many of these are built into the operating system. Remember, it's through the use of this polling process called interrupts that the computer system itself will recognize different processes and devices and allow them to interact with the computer system itself. This polling process is done through addressing, and we've already described this. Remember, we called these the interrupts. We had maskable and unmaskable interrupts. Uh, again, this is the polling process where the CPU polls each interrupt and sees if that particular device or process is ready for some work to be done. If not, the CPU moves to the next interrupt and simply polls around until everybody is at a, at a turn. In this diagram, we see two different types of devices that we might need to communicate with. On the left, we see a character-based device, 
and on the right we see a block-based device. In other words, is this device going to send me individual characters and I need to treat each character as a discrete entity or object or component versus the devices on the right that use blocks of information and I will uh, I will allow blocks of information to flow through the I.O. device, perhaps reassemble those blocks into a program or a file, and then can access the object as this now cohesive component. We described device drivers a little while ago. Device drivers live at ring two in the ring architecture. They are closer to the kernel of the operating system than the user, therefore they have a greater security domain, they have more privilege than the subject does, and again these are very often mechanisms that bad guys use to infiltrate and then violate the operating system and your valuable information assets. Again, these device drivers live closer to the kernel and provide the attacker closer access to the kernel. Some devices use something called direct memory access channels or DMA channels. This is where this device has a region of memory allocated to the device itself and can write directly without making requests to that location in memory. Again, uh, this very often is a mechanism used by bad guys to populate the computer with malware and then find some other mechanism to launch that malware. These programs and applications and processes that we use, of course, are very, very complex. I recently did a survey of my laptop, and on one of the two hard drives in my laptop, I have half a million files. Very, very complex. All the drivers, all the support files, the programs, the executables, and then, of course, my data. So we have very, very complex structures in software and operating system to provide the feature-rich capability that our programs uh, and we as users desire. These many different avenues, this very complex structure, allows many types of compromises. Uh, so let's first look at this trust hierarchy on how the operating system, how this computer system, I should say, functions. First, the user, who is at the lowest level of trust, has trust for the application that he's launching. He trusts that the application will not violate the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of the data that the application is processing. The application trusts that the operating system will support the application correctly and not violate CIRA of the data set. And then, of course, the operating system trusts the hardware. That's the physical construct that the operating system lives upon. So user trusts the app, the app trusts the OS, and the OS trusts the hardware. It's only through this trust hierarchy that we might ever manipulate or store our data on computer systems and have some level of confidence that our information will remain intact and available. We have the compromise from above. The compromise from above is where we have an unprivileged user. Now this is an unauthorized user. Perhaps this is a user Bobo that uh, steals Lulu's, a different user's, username and password, and then logs on as, as, as Lulu. So if Bobo logs on as Lulu, he is an unauthorized or unprivileged user, and he's now moving about with Lulu's level of privilege. Any exploits that he implements, any, any damage he introduces is a compromise from above. Compromise from within is when Lulu logs on as Lulu and somehow steps beyond the boundaries of what she should be doing. This is where a privileged user misuses their level of privilege. That's a compromise from within. And then finally, compromise from below is typically considered where we have malware or virus that embeds itself into the BIOS or firmware in a computer system and then this particular piece of software performs some damage to the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of your valuable information asset. 